Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining uh, this week's CIR talk series. Uh, my name is Hamad Zamani, and I'm the moderator of this talk. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce uh, Yongfeng Zhang from the Rutgers University. Yongfeng is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at Rutgers University, and he directs the Web Intelligence Systems and Economics Lab. Uh, his research interests is in information retrieval, recommender systems, economics of data science, explainable AI, fairness in AI, and AI ethics. So very broad range of topics. Uh, previously, he was actually a member of CIR. He was, a he was doing a postdoc with Bruce Croft uh, at the CIR, and he did his PhD and bachelor's um, at Xinhua University. Uh, he got a, a degree in computer science and also in economics at Peking University. And he's a civil scholar of the class of 2015. Without further ado, uh, I'd like to invite Yong Feng to talk to us about uh, explainable human-centered AI. OK. Thank you so much, uh, Hamed, for introduction. And it's so nice to be back, even though it's online. So uh, um, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'm going to talk about explainable um, human-centered AI uh, in this uh, talk. So we know that AI helps in many human-centered tasks, right? Like uh, recommended systems, search engine, QA, right? help systems, legal experts, and the conversational uh, systems. So in, all, in a lot of cases, uh, we not only want to know uh, that a model really works, for example, making accurate predictions, but also we want to know why it works, for example, why the model makes this decision and why should we trust this decision. So this is even more important in those what we call as high stake applications that are related to health, safety and uh, law, for example, um, healthcare, e-healthcare systems, self-driving and uh, legal assistance because the errors or bias in these systems may cause severe losses in people's life, money, or even reputation. So explainable AI can help humans to make better decisions in the context. So I would like to use a uh, very intuitive, motivative example to show the importance of explainable AI in these kind of uh, systems. For example, um, um, uh, resume ranking and uh, recommendation. This is a very typical human-centered task. So the background is that many companies use automated tools such as the uh, LinkedIn for recruiting. So I'm not sure if you are familiar, LinkedIn uh, has one uh, platform for normal users, but they also have another platform which is for recruiters from companies to use. So when a job is posted, the company could receive thousands of applicants and it seems possible for the human resource recruiters to manually screen every candidate's resume to, to make a decision. So um, one solution is to use machine learning to rank the candidates based on some matching score between the candidate's resume and the job description. And uh, you only, you're only going to get a chance of the interview if the algorithm ranks, you, ranks your resume at the top positions, for example, the top 10, right? So here comes the problem from both of the two uh, perspectives. One is from the recruiter's perspective. They want to know why this candidate, why the algorithm believes that this candidate is better fit for my job, right? So from the applicant's perspective, they also want to know why should I trust this algorithm, right? Why should my whole career be decided by a machine, by an algorithm, right? So if we do not solve this problem carefully to make cause severe problems in our society. So to answer these why questions, we need uh, uh, explainable AI. So in this talk, um, I'm going to um, 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 talk about our recent work on explainable human-centered AI on two dimensions. One is the methodology, another is the task. So on the methodology dimension, we're going to talk about neurologic and the neurosymbolic reasoning, knowledge graph reasoning and uh, natural language generation. So on the, um, um, on the other direction, on the other dimension, we're going to talk about uh, several different applications like uh, solving equations and uh, personalized recommendation, search and the dialogue systems. <clears throat> so to begin with, I'd like to uh, put this picture here, right? So because recently machine learning is so popular, so successful that many people even, believe, even think that AI is equal to machine learning. But I would like to use this picture to show that 
AI does not equal to machine learning, but actually AI includes machine learning. Except for machine learning, there are some other approaches to artificial intelligence like uh, planning, uh, reasoning search, and uh, knowledge representation and reasoning. So here is a very, um, very rough, very broad history of uh, AI research. Broadly speaking, uh, we can think that there are two broad approaches to AI. One is a symbolic reasoning approach to AI. Another is machine learning approach to AI. So the symbolic reasoning approach was prospering from the mid 1950s to late 1980s. So we call that, we call that a good old fashioned AI or GoFi. So the machine learning approach was popular uh, beginning from the 1990s to date uh, with the uh, popular deep learning models recently. So they are, both of the two approaches, we see that there are very a lot of uh, 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 methods that uh, we have been hearing for a long time, right? For example, in the left side, we have A star search, knowledge representation and reasoning, production rules, and alpha beta pruning, right? They have been applied in, for example, expert systems and uh, IBM Deep Blue, which is a chess AI system. On the right side, there are a lot of uh, uh, typical models, for example, support vector machine, right? matrix factorization, uh, representation learning, and the neural networks. And they have been applied also in recommended systems, image and the language processing, um, something like that. So these two approaches actually practice different philosophies for AI, what we call as symbolism versus uh, connectionism. Sometimes we also call them rationalism versus empirism approaches to AI. So basically they practice two different types of uh, uh, model design approaches in these two, um, in these two um, uh, uh, different philosophies for AI. The symbolic approach or rationalism approach um, practice a top-down model design approach, which means that we design the rules and uh, we have the input data so that we're going to do a symbolic reasoning um, using our rules over the data to get the answers directly. So the machine learning approach practice another, what we call as bottom up design approach. For example, in supervised learning, we have the data, we have the answers to the data, and we feed these two, I mean, these signals into a machine learning model, and the model is going to be learned. The model is going to serve as our rules so that we're going to use it to make new predictions. So there are advantages and disadvantages for, I mean, both of the two approaches. For the symbolic approach, the really can make very, accurate decisions. And uh, it's very um, highly explainable and human readable. But the disadvantage is that it, it requires extensive uh, human um, efforts to design the rules. And it's difficult to handle noisy data. For the um, um, uh, machine learning approach, it requires less human efforts and uh, it works, works, works better at, with noisy data. But uh, the decisions are usually uh, approximate and sometimes difficult to explain. So this is our, uh, the, the problem that we are going to talk about mostly in, 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 this, in this talk. So a natural idea is that uh, can we possibly bridge the best of the two worlds, right? Can we uh, bridge neuro-symbolic machine learning models that are both accurate and transparent so that we can make um, high accurate decisions and in the meantime, it is explainable. However, the key challenge here is that uh, most of the machine learning models, for example, neural networks, they work in the continuous differentiable, I mean, differentiable continuous space. But um, uh, the symbolic reasoning approach, they work in the discrete symbolic space. So how to bridge the differentiable neural networks and the discrete symbolic reasoning in a shared architecture for optimization of the inference, this is a very uh, uh, difficult challenge here. So um, to, to motivate our uh, approach, I'm going to uh, briefly introduce, I believe that everybody uh, is familiar with this, the SAT problem, right? So the SAT problem is that given a uh, logical equation, right? Um, do we know that if there exists a valid value assignment for the variables so that this equation can, be, can hold? For example, given this, we can easily know that when A is false, B is true, C is true, then the equation would be true. For this one, it's impossible for this equation to hold because not A and A cannot be true at the same time. Right? So for, 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 for these simple uh, examples, uh, we humans can easily identify if it is satisfiable. But uh, I mean, if the equation is very large, it will be very challenging. And actually S3, SAT is the first problem proven to be NP-complete 
in the computer science um, uh, research. An extension of uh, the SD, SAT problem is, the, is to solve logical equations. For example, given this set of logical equations, can we solve the value of the variables A, B, C, is A true or false, B true or false, or C uh, true or false? And can we further uh, predict the true false value for new equations? Right? This is uh, the um, logical, uh, so logical, logical equation problem, which is also an MP complete problem. So the reason we uh, begin with logical expressions is that they are highly transparent, right? Because for example, this is true is because A is false and the B, C would be, is, is B, C are true. So we can easily know why we get a true or false result for our logical equation. And besides that, many applications can be formulated as a logical reasoning uh, problem. And uh, it helps to enhance the explainable uh, AI in uh, many applications. So now the question is that can we use machine learning to solve the uh, logical equations and to predict the value of new logical equations? So um, some technical, um, not very deep, but some uh, 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 simple technical uh, details here. Um, the basic idea is to that we propose is to uh, uh, learn the logical variables as vectors in the logical embedding space and to learn the logical operations such as and, or, and not, as neural modules in the latent space. So that in this way, if we would like to calculate the and between two variables, we only need to put the vector of the two variables through this and module and get a new vector embedding. And we hope that this new vector embedding represents the logical and between the input two variables, similar for um, or and uh, not. So if we do have such kind of uh, a logical embedding space and uh, a, the, the, the logical uh, modules, right? So we can dynamically assemble a neural network for any input logical expression. Even though the logical expression is very long, we can still dynamically assemble a neural architecture. This is an advantage because we can, in this way, we can represent a, a compositional number of uh, 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 input expressions. For example, VI and the VG or not VK, right? It's very simple. We just calculate the VI and the um, VG first, then not VK. Then we are going to apply an or or these two parts to get the final vector representation for the whole logical expression. So that we compare this logical expression with a constant true vector using some kind of similarity function to decide if uh, um, the logical expression would, is, is true or false. Right? And uh, um, we can easily optimize this framework using back propagation using standard uh, task dependent loss functions, for example, uh, cross entropy loss for classification tasks and the pairwise ranking for search and uh, recommendation tasks. So I think that by now you may have a question that how do we know that the the end module that we uh, that we uh, use here is really doing the logical end, similar for the or and uh, uh, not module? So to us, it's just a neural module, right? How do we know that it's really doing end? So to solve the problem, we introduce what we call as logical regularization. Right? So basically, we need to guarantee that each logical operator satisfies a certain root. For example, for the not module, right, we, we need to, uh, for example, we need the not module to satisfy the double negation rule, which means that if for, for a variable W, right, if we apply the not operation over W for twice, then we should return W itself. Right? So to represent this, we can use this regularizer. For example, we, we uh, process W using the not module for twice and we calculate the similarity between w and between w and the not not w so if we minimize this r2 we're actually trying to maximize the similarity between uh, double negation of w and the w itself right? so similar for other rules for uh, and and or so all of these logical regularizers can be added into the loss function to guarantee that our uh, logical modules are uh, working in the way that we expect. So uh, as one um, application, we can use machine learning to solve logical equations. Actually, I think this is very interesting because traditionally, this is a very theoretical problem, but now we can try to use machine learning to solve uh, 
uh, uh, uh, logical equations. <clears throat> the problem is that given some training logical equation, right, we would like to uh, calculate the true false value for all of the variables in the equation. And uh, we would like to predict the true false value for, for new expressions like this. So we can see that uh, uh, this, this table shows the accuracy for uh, predicting the true false value of new expressions. Right? For example, we can get about 94 or even 95% uh, accuracy in terms of solving uh, new uh, uh, logical expressions. And this figure shows how does the variable change in the embedding space during the learning uh, process. So originally, all of the variables like this, V98, something like that, all of the variables are randomly initialized. So it's something like this. But you can see that during the learning procedure, the variables are separated into two groups. One group represents the true variable, another represent, represents the false variable. So the, eventually the accuracy of the variable solving is about uh, 96%. So this shows that we can use machine learning to approximately solve NP complete problems like uh, solving logical um, equations. So another application is a more uh, practical ac application which is explainable uh, recommendation. Actually recommended system is a very uh, representative uh, human centered AI task because it naturally involves human in the loop. Basically humans are going to produce data by interacting with the recommender system. So the recommender system are going to learn AI machine learning models using the data and in turn provide new recommendations to the users. So that uh, is a, it's a, it's a human-centered, human-in-the-loop machine learning task. And uh, a recommender system have been widely used in a lot of applications like e-commerce, social networks, right? And um, uh, even some high stake applications like uh, financial recommendation, legal service like uh, uh, payroll decision recommendation, and even medical services, for example, uh, doctor recommendation and the patient doctor uh, matching. So in these cases, explanation is extremely important because the system is eventually making suggestions or even making decisions for humans so that the humans naturally want to know why you make this recommendation to me, right? Why, sh why should I follow your recommendation? And uh, by providing explanations, it can help to improve the uh, transparency, trustworthiness, and reliability of the systems. Actually, this is an important approach towards uh, uh, responsible AI. So how can we possibly use neurologic reasoning for uh, explainable recommendation and improve the explainability? So the intuition here is that uh, the logical expression can help us to model the atom relationships in recommendation. For example, some products are uh, complementary and some products are substitutive. For example, an iPhone and a iPhone case are complementary products so that uh, iPhone and the iPhone case should be true, which means that if you have purchased iPhone, then there would be a high probability for you to purchase iPhone case also. Right? So some other products are uh, substitutive like uh, Coke and the Pepsi. Usually if you purchase Coke, then you're not going to purchase Pepsi. Right? And if you purchase Pepsi, then you're not going to purchase Coke, Coke so that we can represent their uh, substitutive relationship uh, uh, in this way. And of course, there are some other products that are irrelevant. For example, an iPhone and a Android data line would be false. So based on this intuition, the user's interaction history can be uh, represented as uh, logical expressions. For example, if we know that uh, historically the user uh, uh, purchased the product V1 and V2, the user likes V1, but dislikes V2, right? And after that, the user purchased the V3. So how can we represent this using a uh, logical expression? We're going to think that what is the reason for the user to purchase V3? Possibly there could be three reasons. One is that uh, the user likes V1, right? Because the user already told us it likes he likes V1. And, um, um, or another possible reason is that the user dislike V2. Right? Or another possible reason is that the user likes V1, V1 and dislikes V2 at the same time. And that's the reason for the user to purchase V3. So that, I mean, this user's data can be represented as a uh, logical expression. So we have a lot of users so that we have a lot of logical expressions so that we can um, directly apply the uh, logical reasoning, sorry, 
logical reasoning uh, model that we have introduced uh, to solve the uh, variables and to make predictions by using, for example, uh, Perry's ranking loss. So um, um, this table shows that uh, we can improve the recommendation accuracy first uh, by using logical expression because we can capture the uh, complementary and the substitutive relationships between products in the, uh, in the model. So um, another thing is that we can extract explanations for the uh, recommendations. Basically the end module can extract complementary atom explanations. For example, if the model tell us that iPhone and iPhone case is true, then our explanation would be right, we recommend that this iPhone case is because you have purchased the iPhone and these two products are uh, complementary. <clears throat> okay, so um, the next approach that uh, we have been trying to uh, for explainable AI is knowledge graph reasoning. So uh, knowledge graph is widely used in a lot of IR tasks, including recommendation and the search engines. So um, um, in a knowledge graph, a final for example, in recommendation, uh, our final decision is to make a recommendation for the user. So in knowledge graph reasoning, the pass, uh, the reasoning pass can naturally serve as the explanation of our uh, decision. For example, if we start from this user and we recommend uh, the atom A, right, and we see that there are several paths from A to the atom, so the pass can serve as the explanations. For example, we recommend atom A is because you have purchased atom B before, and another user uh, who also purchased atom B um, um, further purchased atom A, and that's why we uh, recommended this product for you. So um, this will help us to produce very intuitive explanations and, um, um, and, uh, and actually feasible explanations for the users. So to solve the problem, we uh, propose a uh, reinforcement learning approach over knowledge graph uh, for explainable uh, recommendation. So uh, we're not going to dive into too much details of this model, but I'm going to just going to show the key idea here. The idea is that we like to train, train an agent so that this agent is, is smart, it's intelligent in that uh, when starting from a user, the agent is going to explore this knowledge graph. And we hope that the agent would have a high probability to reach a product or a atom, whatever, a recommendation that uh, the user will like. Right? So basically uh, we have a lot of training data. We're going to uh, ask the agent to explore in the knowledge graph. If the agent reach uh, 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 an atom that the user really likes, then we're going to give a high, a good reward to the agent. Otherwise, if the agent reach at a uh, product that the user dislike, then we're going to penalize uh, this agent so that eventually the agent would be trained smart to always find the good products for the user. And uh, after our agent has been trained, uh, we can, uh, for, for any user, we, uh, if we want to make recommendations for the user, we can ask the agent to explore the knowledge graph and uh, uh, reach at a recommendation, for example, at I. And the pass that our agent has just explored would naturally be the explanation of the agent's decision. So, uh, 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 so again, uh, we can achieve uh, uh, good uh, recommendation accuracy uh, using this uh, uh, knowledge graph reasoning approach. And in the meantime, uh, we can generate explanations. For example, we recommend this conditioner is because you have purchased the shampoo, this product before. So both this product you purchased and this new product are commonly described by uh, these features. That's why we recommended this uh, new atom for you. So as an extension to, uh, to this approach, uh, uh, we hope to uh, conduct explainable conversational AI. The re for example, conversational recommendation. Right? So conversational recommendation provides uh, uh, personalized recommendation to users through uh, natural language dialogue. And usually uh, this dialogue can be conducted through uh, voice-based uh, interfaces, for example, Siri, right? Alexa, and uh, Apple um, HomePod. <clears throat> so uh, compared to traditional uh, recommendation, explanation is even more important in conversational recommendation scenario. Why? The reason is that uh, 
usually in the voice-based channels, we can only uh, provide one single recommendation uh, through the voice channel. You know, in the traditional uh, interface screen-based recommendation uh, interface, we can recommend uh, five or even 10 recommendations for the user at the same time. But in a voice-based channel, it would be, I mean, it would be very boring if the, uh, if the, uh, um, the agent just uh, read out 10 recommendations uh, at the same time, right? So that will only make the conversation uh, very boring. So because the uh, voice channel, you already, uh, you already can only make uh, one piece of uh, recommendation. So it is very important for the agent to explain to the user why I'm making this single uh, recommendation. Sometimes the user may even ask, actively ask, why do you recommend this, uh, this music to me, for example. Then we hope that the agent would have the ability to, uh, to answer these kind of uh, why type questions to explain um, why do we make this recommendation. So uh, one approach that uh, we can explore is, uh, uh, is uh, human in the loop learning. For example, uh, human in the loop knowledge graph uh, reasoning which can enable us to, uh, uh, to develop an explainable uh, conversational recommendation system. The key idea is to uh, conduct a transparent uh, dialogue, tr dialogue state tracking over the knowledge graphs. So on the surface, it's a dialogue. For example, the user asks, uh, I'd like to, I would like a snack on Amazon. So could you please recommend uh, a snack for me? Right? Then the agent uh, are going to interact with the user by asking several questions. For example, uh, do you wish to try dark chocolate? Right? If the user said no, then uh, the agent would possibly ask another question. Do you uh, prefer uh, vanilla? Um, sorry, uh, vanilla flavor. So during the course of the conversation, the user may ask uh, why type of questions in the middle of the conversation. For example, the user ask, why do you think that I would prefer uh, Rolina flavor, right? Why do you ask this question? So we hope that if the user really asks such, such kind of uh, why type of questions, our agent can uh, provide answers. So basically, if we can do uh, um, human loop knowledge graph reasoning um, 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 behind the system, we can always track our state, dialogue state over uh, during the course of the conversation so that we can provide uh, uh, explanations. <clears throat> For example, if the user asks, "Why do you prefer uh, Verbena?" Uh, why do you ask me that I possibly like uh, uh, this flavor? Uh, for example, um, uh, uh, the agent may find that there is a pass uh, from the user to Verbena uh, through the product, which is called Kind Bar. Right? Then the um, the agent can 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 produce this explanation. So the reason I ask this is because you have liked uh, this product before, and uh, that product was uh, Verlina flavor, and that's why I think you possibly would like Verlina flavor for, 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 for the snack. Right? So if the agent can answer these questions, that will make the conversation more, uh, 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 make the agent more uh, uh, trustworthy to, to the user, and uh, because the agent can justify the decisions, the user can know that uh, the agent is not making arbitrary decisions, for the user. Um, another extension is the uh, fairness of explanations. <clears throat> so um, the reason that we, uh, we, we work on this problem is that we have an observation that, uh, for example, in a typical uh, e-commerce system, if we split the users into two groups, one is the uh, top five active user, which mean, which are the top five present user who have purchased a lot of uh, products in the system. Another group is the other 95%, what do we call it, inactive user. So um, uh, we can find that uh, the uh, recommendation performance for the um, active user uh, would be much, much better than the recommendation performance for the inactive user. For example, the NDCG for active user is 50%, but the NDCG for inactive user is less than a half of the uh, performance uh, of the active users. So this means that the active users are experiencing a more, uh, a better uh, a recommendation experience in the IR system. So maybe the top 5% users are economically more advantaged users so that they can purchase more products in the system so that they can insert more training data into the recommendation machine learning model. And because of this, the model 
the active user's data will dominate the machine learning model and the model would be uh, biased to make recommendations, which means that even for those inactive users, uh, the, the, the model is still recommending products that are, that, are, that are actually more liked by the active users. So um, to solve the problem, we, uh, pursue, we can pursue fairness aware explainable recommendation. Basically, we can add uh, this kind of uh, unfairness constraints into our um, um, uh, machine learning model. So basically, we have two groups of users, G1 and the G2, and uh, we are going to calculate the recommendation accuracies, whatever uh, measure here. For example, the recommendation, average recommendation accuracy for group one and for group two. And we're going to calculate the difference in their um, recommendation accuracy between the two groups. And we hope that uh, the difference would be upper bounded by some uh, threshold. So in this way, we can guarantee that the recommendation experience between the two groups are not too different. Right? So uh, the experimental results are interesting that uh, sometimes we can improve the recommendation experience for both active users and the inactive users. Sometimes the active users recommendation performance would be slightly uh, uh, decreased and the inactive users uh, uh, performance uh, uh, accuracy uh, would be slightly improved. But uh, in no matter which case, the overall recommendation performance would be increased for all of the users. That is because the, uh, <clears throat> the inactive users occupy uh, the majority of the system, like 95%. So as long as we can improve the uh, experience for these inactive users by a little bit, the total improvement uh, in, the, in, the overall, in, the, in the overall system would be uh, huge. Okay. So uh, based with this, I'd like to make a brief discussion about uh, transparency and uh, fairness and their relationship. So transparency and fairness are two important aspects of uh, responsible AI. And recently there has been some legal uh, regulations uh, to responsible AI, for example, uh, GDPR and the California Pri Privacy Act. <clears throat> so they all emphasize the fairness of algorithm decisions in the AI systems. However, the law enforcement of these legal regulations is a big challenge, right? So how does the law enforcement department if a system is a fire, is fire or unfair, is impossible, is unrealistic, for them to check the source code, right? Because the modern AI systems are very complicated. And uh, sometimes they are even, a lot of times they are even um, confidential. The code, the source code is our confidential assets of the private entities. So we cannot just, uh, I mean, check them uh, easily. So um, one possible solution for this uh, uh, problem is fairness through transparency, which means that um, we do not directly examine if the algorithm is fair or unfair, but instead we're going to require the system to provide explanations to users, to each and every individual user about why its decision is fair for the user. And uh, we can rely on each and every user to monitor the system, which means that if user um, um, do not accept the explanation, then they may report it to the, uh, to the agency or to the company so that they can improve the algorithm. So in this way, we can build a virtual cycle between the sometimes monopolized market and, uh, and the users, um, for example, uh, e-commerce system and social networks. Right? In this case, um, the market, the system are going to uh, provide uh, both recommendations and explanations to the users, and the users are going to monitor if the uh, decision is fair for myself. If the user has, have nothing, has nothing to complain, then that's good, that's fine, nothing happens, right? If the user is not satisfied with the uh, explanation, then the user may uh, raise a complaint so that so we know what happens, what is the problem, and so that we know how to fix the algorithm uh, in a targeted way. So the final uh, thing that I would like to uh, uh, briefly mention is natural language explanation. <clears throat> So natural language sentence is the most uh, uh, human friendly way of uh, uh, producing explanations. Right? So um, 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 the vision here is that I think that a human and the machine will inevitably uh, collaborate with each other in future jobs. Uh, sometimes people have been talking about this, right? Sometimes AI may replace the human jobs and uh, in a lot of other cases, uh, humans will partly replace human jobs. 
which means that a human and the AI are going to collaborate in the in the in the work environment to finish some tasks. So um, because of this and of this contents, context, we think that we believe that future machines should be able to explain themselves through natural language because not every not everybody is AI or AI expert, right? They cannot understand the technical details underlying the complicated algorithm. So that they need more um, more um, uh, plain explanations like uh, natural language explanations. So we believe that this will greatly help to foster the better understanding and collaboration and trust between human and machine in the future when they have to uh, collaborate with, with each other in the working environment. So um, explain recommendation is actually a very suitable task to explore natural language explanations because we have ground truth, high quality ground truth explanations from humans in this, uh, in this task. For example, in e-commerce, sometimes people, when they purchase something, they are going to write a review. And a lot of sentences in the review are actually their own explanations about why do I like this product or, or uh, why do I uh, dislike this product? But uh, the problem is that explanation generation is very different from uh, free text uh, generation because explanation is some kind of a purpose text generation, which means that explanation needs to meet a certain purposes. Because of this, we require more uh, controllability of the uh, generation model. Actually, this is controllability is a very significant problem in current natural language generation models. Uh, for example, the large language models like uh, GPT, uh, that the people are talking about now. So if we cannot control the behavior of the generation models, it will be very difficult for us to really use these models in, in, in practical systems because the, we, we don't know the, what language the model is going to generate. It may generate even harmful languages. Right? So to, uh, in the recommendation scenario, uh, to improve the controllability of, uh, of the uh, system, we care about two types uh, of controllable factors. One is that we hope the model can uh, generate explanations over different features. Okay, so if we want the model to talk about bathroom, then we can generate an explanation on bathroom. If we can, um, um, uh, if we hope the model to generate explanation on tub, then we can also use the model to generate a sentence on this feature. Right? Another uh, factor is to control the sentiment, which means that we want the explanation to be honest. That means if our model believes that the recommendation score for the product is very low, right? so the model thinks that the user should not purchase this product, then um, we hope that the model can generate a negative explanation for why should you not purchase this product rather than cheating the user to purchase this product using some, some, using some uh, fancy languages. So um, a solution is that uh, we are going to pursue neural template generation. So there are usually two types of uh, sentence generation uh, approaches. One is template based, uh, which is highly controllable, but uh, less flexible because the sentence template is manually designed by humans. So uh, another type, uh, another approach is uh, free text uh, sentence generation, which is uh, highly flexible, but uh, not very controllable. So by combining these two approaches, we can um, possibly generate uh, produce models that are both controllable and uh, um, uh, and flexible in terms of the generated explanations. So here is a brief, brief picture of the model. Uh, uh, I'm just going to briefly uh, go over the model. Uh, so uh, except the traditional inputs like the recommendation score, we also have the required sentiment and the user atom feature so that the explanation is personalized. Also, we have a feature as the input to control what a feature do we want the model to talk about. And finally, we can train a sequence to sequence model, for example, to generate the um, explanations. So here are the, some examples of the generated explanations. We can see that uh, we can, on one side, we can control what the features to talk about in the generated explanation. It can be about the bathroom, tub, or room, right? or uh, furniture, or airport. Right? And on the other side, we can control the sentiment of uh, the um, generated uh, explanation. For example, if the model believes the recommendation score is high, like 3.9 or even four, then 
the generated explanation are positive, right? For example, the bathroom was large and has had a separate shower. Right? However, if the recommendation score is low, then the uh, sentiment of the generated explanation is negative. For example, it is not close to the airport or the furniture is worn. So um, uh, finally, we can um, uh, further provide the visual explanations for users beyond the text explanation. The reason is that in these talks, a lot of times uh, text and the image are aligned with each other. So uh, some features in the text are actually talking about some certain features in the visual image so that we can um, de develop a vision language co-learning model to generate not only uh, uh, visual, not only text explanations, but also um, visual explanations. So uh, for example, here is some, uh, uh, some, 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 uh, some text and the visual explanations that we can uh, produce. For example, this is the text explanation, right? So, and uh, in the meantime, uh, we can produce a visual explanation which highlights the area in the image that uh, the, uh, that the uh, 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 sentence is talking about. Right? So that, uh, for, for example, uh, this sentence is talking about the finger and the hand so that we can highlight this part, right? So in this way, uh, uh, it can greatly help the users to better understand our explanations by uh, aligning the uh, text and the image at the same time. So uh, uh, I think that I can uh, give a brief summary here so that uh, we can have a uh, QA session uh, soon. So as a brief summary, um, um, in the talk, we're, going, we're talking about explainable human-centered AI, right? where, uh, where we are talking about uh, some applications like a search and the recommendation systems and uh, uh, dialogue systems. And also we introduced uh, um, several different approaches towards explainable human-centered AI, uh, including uh, neurologic reasoning, knowledge graph reasoning, and uh, natural language uh, generations. So basically, I think that our vision is that uh, uh, in the future, explanation between the human and the machines are going to be um, really important because they are going to work collaboratively to solve problems so that uh, to foster better understanding and the trust uh, um, uh, uh, um, between the human and the machines we hope that machines can explain their decisions to humans using um, both faithful and uh, intuitive languages so that they can understand each other. Okay, so uh, that's what I want to say. Uh, if there's any question, uh, I'm glad to uh, communicate. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was a very interesting talk and very thoughtful. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. So it's the Q&A time. We have plenty of time for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to write in the chat. Uh, so, oh, yeah, we already have one oh, yeah. from Steve Harding. So the question is wondering about, oops, um, wondering about user inputs in determining fairness. Could there be a bias between those happy with the results versus those unhappy? Seems people who are unhappy will provide input more than those happy or at least satisfied with the results. Can this input bias uh, truthfulness of user inputs? Yeah, that is a very, um, um, very good question. Yeah, so um, actually not only uh, I mean, yes, as you said that uh, maybe um, um, if uh, people are unhappy, then they probably are going to write more, right? To make complaints. And on the, on the other hand, there are even, um, you know, um, promoted, I mean, uh, no, so, so, I mean, yeah, promoted the um, reviews, for example, in e-commerce systems, which mean that, for example, sometimes a seller would like to promote their own product, then they are going to write a lot of uh, positive reviews for their product. Sometimes they may even hire some, 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 some people to purposely write some good reviews for their product. So I think that is, this is a, uh, uh, not only a buyer's problem, but actually a, um, a, um, um, 
robustness problem of our uh, recommender systems. Can our model be possibly robust to this kind of uh, what we call as uh, shading of text to the recommender systems? So uh, yes, I think that this problem can possibly be solved on, 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 I mean, on two directions. One is the fairness direction. Another is on the robustness direction. So on the fairness direction, we can, I mean, we assume that we trust all the reviews are, 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 are no matter positive or negative, right? We trust that they are, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are real, um, they are correct reviews. And uh, we can analyze the, um, uh, analyze the, um, um, the, uh, uh, the difference between um, the distrib the difference in terms of distribution between uh, these two types of reviews and uh, so improve fairness. And on the other hand, maybe um, uh, we can, Develop some models to uh, remove those less trustworthy uh, reviews from the system to make the uh, recommendations and explanations more um, reasonable, more trustable. Uh, yeah, to the system. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so there is another question by Jeremy Pickens in the chat. Um, he's asking, "I've long felt that explainability should lead to more user control." For example, if the AI explains that the explanation for vanilla was the kind bar, then users should be able to change the reason and get a different recommendation at the same time. Do you see your approaches leading uh, in this direction? Yeah, that's a very, uh, very important, yeah, very exciting question. So. I also believe that there should be more controllability so that if we, if the user uh, changes something, they can directly see how the result changes. So um, actually, uh, I mean, I believe one promising approach toward this is, is counterfactual reasoning or um, causal reasoning or counterfactual reasoning. So actually we're working on these problems, but since it's still an initial stage, so I didn't talk about too much details here, but uh, by doing, by counterfactual reasoning, we can purposely uh, control the model so that, uh, I mean, um, I mean, basically the, 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 the intuitive idea of counterfactual reasoning is that uh, we're going to change some of, the, some of the inputs and we're going to look at how does the output change according to the change in the input so that we can find some cause relations between the input and output. And by borrowing this uh, uh, cause, the relations that we have um, uh, found from this uh, uh, counterfactual reasoning procedure, we can make the model more controllable. So then we can predict uh, to the user that uh, if we can promise to the user, right? I mean, which that, uh, if, for example, if you uh, didn't, um, uh, uh, um, I mean, the explanation would be something like this. We can tell the user, the, re the reason we uh, recommend this atom is because you have purchased uh, another atom before. And if you didn't purchase that product, rather you purchased a third product, then would, we would recommend something different. So uh, in this way, we can clearly let the user know um, why um, we recommend this recommendation and uh, um, um, how would the user change their behavior to expect uh, a change in the recommendation result. Yeah. Okay, thank so, you. Yeah. Uh, so there is another question by Ari. Uh, the question is, are there ways that we can ensure fairness when different parties have different transparency? For example, some kids do not have parents who help with college applications and are at a disadvantage. Are there ways to adapt this technology for these purposes? Yeah, so um, I think the question here is that uh, maybe um, how do we define, uh, how do we define which group of people are disadvantaged group and which group of people are advantaged group in the, uh, in, 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 when solving, uh, when developing um, fairness models. Um, actually, I don't think I have a definite answer for this question because this is not, not only a technical problem, it's actually a very complicated problem. And uh, so uh, we have a guarantee that so we should, uh, um, in, at the same time, we should promote fairness and at the other time, we should not hurt anybody. So I think that maybe, um, 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 maybe a possible way is to pursue Pareto uh, optimality or Pareto fairness, which means that uh, 
um, uh, we try to increase the utility of some group without hurting the utility of other group. Uh, maybe this is not possible in some cases, but this is um, possibly an, a, a, an approach to make sure that we can uh, increase fairness and in the meantime, uh, do not hurt uh, people. So um, 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 I think as a summary to the, uh, to the question, I think that uh, um, um, when developing fairness machine learning models, and uh, um, 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 it's, I mean, keep in mind, it's not a technical problem. It's, it's we need to get um, um, expertise or feedback from not only computer scientists, but also like uh, um, um, uh, legal um, perspectives, psychological perspectives, or um, a lot of other um, subjects to make sure that uh, um, AI and uh, uh, I mean, um, always um, and really achieves the goal that uh, that is reasonable in societal perspective. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and the last question in the chat is from Ro Ronald. Uh, the question is, maybe I'm not really fo following your idea with neural logical reasoning, but how do you come up with these logical equations in the first place? Okay. Um, actually, uh, let me go to this page. Um, for example, in 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 this solving logical equation problem, right? So in this problem, the logical equations are provided. So we need to have a set of uh, given logical equations so that we can uh, solve the value of the variables. And then we can um, um, predict the true false value for for new uh, logical uh, new logical expressions. So um, this is for the uh, solving uh, solving logical equation problem. Basically, we uh, we already have a set of logical equations that we need to solve. Right? Uh, but I think that maybe our question is more related to the uh, um, the explainable recommendation problem. So how do we Construct the logical equations from the training data. So, um, so, um, so basically, I would like to see that what we uh, provide here in the neurological reasoning um, um, technique, it's not a specific technique. Actually, it's a framework. The key idea is that uh, uh, we can uh, learn the logical operations as neural modules, and then and we can use logical regularizations to control the behavior of the neural modules so that uh, whatever logical equation we have, we can convert it into a um, uh, new network. So um, for the recommendation task, uh, it, and, I mean, how do we construct the uh, 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 logical equations depends on our understanding of the problem at hand. For example, in the recommendation problem, we, after analyzing the problem, we think that there are two important types of uh, relationships in uh, uh, between the atoms in this problem, for example, uh, complementary relationship and the substitutive relationship, and uh, based on our understanding of the problem, we can convert the each user's uh, records, each user's behavior record, into a training example, a logical equation like this. Right? For example, if we have uh, one thousand users, right, then we are going to have one thousand uh, logical equations, each corresponds to each particular user's uh, behavior records. So if uh, maybe you're working on another problem, like uh, maybe uh, question authoring or machine reading comprehension, right? Or, um, or some other uh, uh, ranking tasks, for example, then you need to analyze the nature of your problem and uh, uh, come up with how do we uh, define logical equations based on the data available in that problem. And as long as we're able to uh, um, uh, uh, define, convert our training data into these kind of uh, logical equations, then we can apply the uh, neurological reasoning framework to uh, train the model and then to make predictions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, can we still have a couple more minutes? Uh, I'm gonna add use my power as the moderator and ask a question myself. Um, oh, sure, yeah. So my understanding from these uh, not neural logic reasoning model is that they are trying to learn correlations from the data observed in the training data. They are not trying, they're not learning causation of an event 
given some uh, kind of observed events. But when you want to try to explain something, uh, my intuition says that we should look for the causation, not the correlation. Uh, what what do you think about it? Yeah, actually, this is I think this is a very insightful um, question. So. Um, um, my understanding is that um, 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 at least there are two types of, uh, because currently I have been thinking about uh, uh, reasoning rather than learning uh, a little bit. So I think that there are basically there are two uh, important types of reasoning. One is logical reasoning. Another is uh, causal reasoning, right? So um, 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 in this part of the uh, slides, I only, uh, uh, mentioned uh, uh, this paper, which is on CICAM called Neurologic Reasoning. But actually recently we have another paper which is called Neuro Collaborative Reasoning, which is on WWW recently. So this one um, um, formulates the uh, reasoning problem, logical reasoning problem as a implicative reasoning problem, which means that for example, A and B and C would lead to B, which is similar to the if then rules in, um, in, I mean, in, in, in good old fashioned AI uh, research. So um, I cannot confidently say that um, uh, this kind of uh, um, implicative uh, reasoning is a type of causal reasoning, but uh, I do feel that there is some kind of uh, relationship between this kind of between this implicative logical reasoning and the and the causal reasoning, so I even think that mathematically maybe they are the same. They are just using different mathematical languages to talk about the same thing. Um, um, we're we're working on this problem. Maybe it's possible to develop a unified uh, mathematical framework to unify logical reasoning and uh, um, causal reasoning. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, but uh, I think that maybe there are some relationship. But as you said, yes, indeed. So for this model, um, for this uh, this kind of uh, neurological reasoning model, it's more um, logical correlation rather than a logical causation because there is no implicative reasoning. It's just uh, try to um, learn the end or uh, disjunctive or conjunctive relationship between the parameters, right? Um, yeah, but possibly we can advance it to, um, to, to um, implicative uh, or causal logical reasoning. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks again. Uh, we are right at the time. So I'd, look, I'd like to thank you again uh, for giving this very interesting and thoughtful work, for working talks. And okay. uh, thanks everyone for joining there. Oh, uh, just a question came in the chat, but uh, I, I recommend everyone who has questions, send an email to Yongping. I'm sure that yeah, will definitely. have any questions. I'm sorry that I couldn't have a, a time for asking these questions anymore.